Hello, so today I wanted to take a look at one of the ugliest yet coolest rifles ever built in my opinion. So this thing's pretty damn big because it's, if you look up the sort of how the history of this was designed to be used, it's kind of half LMG, half battle rifle. Um, so this is the Swiss Sturmgewehr 57 made by SIG. And these were basically incredibly reliable and incredibly precise battle rifles, but they're a bit on the clunky side and they were also very expensive to mass produce. Um, so this is one of the most expensive rifles of the Cold War in terms of per unit production cost. So what I'm going to do in this video is show you the rifle sort of family it evolved to replace, um, and also show you obviously the FAL, because this is the sort of gun in Switzerland that would be the equivalent of the G3 or the FAL in lots of Western Army arsenals, although it's a lot bigger. So. It's got a couple of cool features on it. Now, obviously, it takes this quite famous bayonet I've done video, uh, videos on before, because the bayonets are a lot cheaper than the guns. So let me just disconnect the bayonet. So the bayonet basically just goes on by sliding forwards. As I've shown you before, these are nice bayonets, but I won't spend too long on this video talking about the bayonet or remove it from it to just give us a bit more room to swing this about for the video. Also, because of YouTube's policies, I can't tell you where I bought this from, but it was the last one in stock anyway, and it's deactivated. So, you know, there's that. So. One of the cool features about this is the bipod. It has a bipod that you can actually have at the front or the back of the sort of barrel. So at the front of, um, back of the barrel, sorry, it's there. Front of the barrel, there's a switch you can push in and then you can just take the bipod up and then click it over there and you've got the bipod at the front of the barrel, which is I imagine where most people would want it to stabilize the end. So you've got two sights, let me pick up the rear sight. You've got basically a peep style sight on this, which is a little bit hard to look through, I'm not going to lie. Um, when you're looking at a white surface, it's very easy to see the front sight. Against something dark, it sort of blurs, so that's not very good. But it also has a glow-in-the-dark tritium sight at the front of this, but you won't be able to see that very well, um, because obviously it's long since stopped glowing. So, it's got three modes of fire on it, or safety and semi and then full automatic and it works using what's called a delayed roller blowback action, if I get that right. It's the same one the G3 uses. Now, the reason this kind of looks such an ugly gun is it's very angular, and the hand guards are all rubberized, and the stock is rubberized. The reason being for that is basically so your face doesn't freeze to it in the Alps. So, this being Swiss, they kind of thought of everything when the gun was being designed, you know, so it would work well. So, the what's quite cool is the when you fold down the bipod, that does actually grip quite well, as you can hopefully see, to the um, handguard. Although the handguard is definitely on the small size on this gun, I think that's something a lot of people wouldn't like. I don't have particularly big hands and mine are a bit pretty squashed in there. It's got a rubberized carry handle, which is fine. So yeah, this is... the easiest way of thinking about this is kind of like a foul but longer, because it was intended as both an LMG and a battle rifle. So it used the 7.5mm by 55 Swiss cartridge, and I'll get one of those out and in a one snap cap to show you. And basically, explain as best I can without obviously speaking French or German some of the history of this rifle I've picked up just from reading about it online and watching other videos on it. If you want to see some good videos on it actually being used, at least in the semi-auto civilian format, there's a Forgotten Weapons and InRange TV, they did a few videos on it, um, showing it working. So anyway, let's um, put it on the floor, and I'm afraid the camera might be a bit dark here, and we'll show it next to the Fowl and the uh, Rubin, the Schmidt Rubin series of rifles that essentially it replaced. Right, hopefully I can get this somewhat in frame, because it's pretty difficult with how long the rifles are. So the wooden rifle at the top is the Schmidt Rubin, the oldest model of it, because we can own it as an obsolete calibre firearm in the UK, still fully functional. Then obviously we've got the Sturmgewehr 57, and then we've got an L1A1, um, the British version of the Fowl. So basically the reason I want the Fowl here is to give you an idea of sort of what most of the contemporary style battle rifles look like. And as you can see, the total length of them isn't that um, different, it's just the Fowl is a lot more streamlined, whereas the Sturmgewehr 57 is definitely much more of a bulky gun. So, Switzerland was using this cartridge, um, the 7.5x55mm uh, in World War II, although obviously they were a neutral country, they weren't fighting in the war, but they were prepared for war. And they carried this cartridge over to the later rifles, so they would have had the K31 rifle, which is a much more modernised version of that in World War One and World War II. Well, World War II and World War One, they'd have had one of the older Rubens. So, 
they came up with this battle rifle that obviously had to meet a massive criteria of um, sort of tests. So, if I can get that in there, all right. There we go. So that's the same cartridge that's sitting um, from the Rubin that's sitting in there. So obviously it's a rockin' style mag like an AK. I can get that in there. There we go. And I'm pretty sure with how this is deactivated, I won't be able to actually put the um, round into chamber. I'll just try that, but um, it's pretty difficult with them. Um, yeah, it doesn't pick any rounds up from the magazine, so um, that just sits there. But anyway, so what the Swiss did was basically design a battle rifle um, that, you know, had a lot of features they wanted in a gun, but was um, obviously, you know, it, look, as I'm, the problem is that with this, without rambling too much, is the Swiss wanted a gun to meet a couple of different criteria, and they weren't really worried about how much money they spent making it. But obviously a lot of guns, the idea comes with the money from guns that you um, export them to other countries. So obviously the FAL known as the right arm of the free world because so many different countries bought variants of the FAL. We either bought a production license or bought them from FN. A lot of company, uh, you know, countries that made just illegal copies. Um, the Swiss didn't manage to sell this gun to very many nations at all, even when they did the 7.62 NATO export version of it. Some nations did buy it for their special forces or mountain troops because, as I said, rubberized parts, very good for the mountains. But lots of nations that bought this for like their special forces just bought fouls for regular soldiers. Which should be quite obvious why when you look at the two guns in terms of like weight and you know everything else. So basically it's very similar power to the foul or any of the other sort of battle rifles of this period, you you know, using basically what is um a full power World War II rifle round. And as you can see if I get the magazines out to compare the sizes, the actual magazines in terms of cartridge size aren't much different at all obviously um this is a 20 round mag this is probably um 24 to 30 round mag i think the swiss ones have this weird thing where they're in like 12 or 24 you know number of um cartridge variants but anyway there's that so this was basically came into service to replace all the bolt action rifles that switzerland used and they wanted something that would function both as a light machine gun and um an accurate rifle because obviously the problem with guns like the FAL is that they're very good as a you know regular infantry rifle, but um, you'd want a machine gun with it. So what lots of nations did was the standard thing of have, having rifles like this and then having machine gunners, um, either using light or medium machine guns, or uh, you know general purpose machine guns. What the Swiss did was, although they probably still had machine guns in service as well, was basically design something that would work with a bipod that would be quite controllable when entrenched on automatic fire mode. Because the Swiss had the um, sort of luxury, if you like, of because they were um, going to be fighting defensively, because they were a neutral country, and they're all going to basically be in horrible mountainous terrain nobody would want to attack, they could be entrenched everywhere, so they could move it around easily enough when they had to move around with these weapons, but then they could just deploy them with the bipod and they'd be very good in sort of static positions. So when this is in use, it's designed to be used more like a Bren gun or another sort of light machine gun, as opposed to actually being moved around like a foul. And I think that's where some of the bad reputation comes from, from people that don't really understand the purpose of what the gun was. Um, you know, they're, they're comparing it either as a light machine gun to other light machine guns, or they're comparing it as like a standard battle sort of assault rifle, you know, infantry rifle, like a G3 or a foul. Um, for standard infantry use, where it's a bit more like, you know, something like an RPK, where it has the pros and cons of both guns, but, you know, it, it, you're not going to get something that's perfect in either regard. So, from what I understand, this was a very reliable gun, um, very, very accurate. You know, if, if you were going to take care of it and look after it, this is probably one of the best sort of battle rifles of the Cold War. Um, especially if it was being issued to you. However, if you're looking at it from a logistics point of view, in terms of like cost of mass production and time to mass produce, you wouldn't want this sort of rifle. As I said, it was good for Switzerland because they were building something like 800,000 over the course of um, 30 odd years, seeing as it was introduced in 1957 and left service sort of properly in the 1990s. Whereas, um, you know, something like the um, Fowls, when nations built them, you know, they were like AKs, you'd churn them out by the millions, um, because they were designed to, you know, be able to, within a few years, you could outfit an entire army of them if you had the production license and the industrial capability to do it. There's an interesting video on YouTube where you can actually see these being produced. Um, and when they're being produced, it does look a lot more sort of, you know, artisan than a lot of, you know, where you see stamped, although this does have stamped parts, it's, um, 
you know, one where it seems a lot more carefully put together and inspected than a lot of other guns are. Another thing of this, it's set capable of shooting rifle grenades. Um, you'll see lots of Swiss stuff shot rifle grenades. I think the idea was that you could have anti-infantry and anti-tank, you know, capability from every single soldier that way if they carried uh, anti-tank and anti-infantry rifle grenades. Obviously, as a machine gun, it would work against infantry and light vehicles and the uh, rifle grenades there to give it, you know, an edge against armoured vehicles. So, yeah. You may have seen these in Honor Majesty's Secret Service because it's the gun Blofeld's henchmen have, and that's where I first saw it and thought, what is that really ugly gun years ago? And then sort of the more I learnt about it, became quite enamoured of it, and then when there was finally one for sale for not for deactivated, you know, for not stupid money, I wanted to get one. Um, but I can certainly say from just picking it up and waving it about, um, it certainly doesn't move around as well as a foul does. And I think you can probably see part of the reason for that is the difference in handguard length. Because the fowls have such a big, good, you know, roundish, large handguard, you can have your hand forward on it, can have your hand back on it, doesn't really matter. With this, your hand is restricted to a very little place on the gun. Um, but like I said, in, in terms of overall length and, you know, where all the bits go, it is just your standard battle rifle. But obviously it's one that's built more with the LMG element in mind. What would be interesting is if anybody's ever used the heavy versions of the FAL, because um, I think a couple of nations used the ones with, you know, longer, heavier barrels and with bipods, um, which were, you know, designed as a light machine gun um, compared to the regular sort of fouls. I wonder how that would compare to this, because I think that might be a more fair comparison. But, yeah, this is kind of one of those jack-of-all-trade guns where they wanted it to be both an LMG and a rifle. Um, and it was actually good at both, but obviously would always be outmatched by a proper LMG or a proper rifle just because of the fact that you know when you make something to fit two criteria you're always going to notice the downsides of either but it's certainly not as clunky as a lot of people say um, like I said the only thing I could see different is maybe the handguard being extended a bit I don't see why they couldn't do that because I know the bipod locks back there but there's probably a way that that could have been done with a you know further forward handguard and I mean, if you've got gloves on, you can probably just hold it by the bipod and you're not going to risk it freezing to your hands anyway. But yeah, overall, um, you can tell it's sort of like a more expensive gun to mass produce than something like the Fowl. Just looking at the two of them, you can see how that's, you know, chunkier and got harder wearing parts. And it's very interesting. And, you know, it's definitely a form over function gun. Because when you look at all the bits, you can understand why they built it in that way, even if it looks ugly. Like I say, and these rubberized bits, why are they on there to stop your hands freezing to it? You know, it's not something that you'd probably consider. That's why it looks chunky and rubbery. But anyway, so it used the um, Swiss cartridge that they used for a very long time, um, was in the old Rubens, not necessarily the ones of this age, because they had a slightly lower power version of... Um, sort of a semi-smokeless or smokeless sort of cartridge, but then later on, the later sort of Schmidt Rubin series went to be using things like this in the K31, and then it carried on with this until the end of the Cold War. And I said, it's it's a pretty comparable round to something like 7.62 NATO. You're gonna get very similar performance out of them. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in sort of one of the more obscure and ugly looking Cold War rifles, um, this is definitely one to pay attention to. One last thing before I end the video, which is really interesting. Let's flick this over. Flick this one over. And look at the um, charging handles, if they're both in frame on both guns. Because a carryover, which I find quite sort of cute, from, I'll just zoom in on that, from the Rubin, or the sort of, you know, K31 series, whatever you want to call it, Schmidt Rubins and this, is they use the same charging handles. Both of them have that sort of beer keg handle. And on the later ones, like the K31, they did have the stainless steel looking ones, like that's on the Sturmgewehr. Whereas on the, um, you know, Rubin, it's like the older bake like kind of resin one, because that's a gun from, you know, before the turn of the 20th century. But anyway, yeah, there you go. Hopefully you found this interesting. And as I said, you know, I find it quite interesting anyway, this sort of thing of, um, you know, a comparison of two similar but different battle rifles, because they are. Um, you know, they were designed to fit the same job, but obviously, um, I think most people would agree the FAW is probably, for quite a right reason, the one that caught on better. Because I think the problem when you have these hybrid guns is, unless you're using them like Switzerland did for a very specialised role, where you're essentially building them for a role you want, most nations would want something that's a bit more specialised at one thing, rather than doing several jobs well, but, you know, making it a bit clunkier and much more expensive per unit. But... There you go.